the wonderful love of Jesus. I had two young men and two young preachers in my office this past week. And what a testimony they are. It was a great joy to have Nikki Cruz and Sonny Argonzoni in my office. Nikki Cruz was the Mama gang leader, gave his heart to Christ. He'd been saved 30 years in preaching. He was the, uh, one of the key characters in the Cross and Switchblade uh, story. And Sonny Argonzoni was the first drug addict uh, we reached for the Lord when we came to New York City three years ago. Nicky was on his way to a crusade in London. He travels all over the world preaching to thousands, and I'll never forget how the love of Jesus touched him. I, every time I go past Fort Greene Projects here in Brooklyn, I get a lump in my throat. I was 115 pounds, 28 years old. But feeling the love of Jesus just rushing to me that Jesus had for drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes. And I walked into this city and I uh, drove in rather 1957 green Chevrolet, slept in the car. I sure wouldn't do it now knowing what I know. But I slept in a car and put newspapers against the window. Found out the worst gang in New York City at that time. In fact, they, they had over, over uh, 300 gangs listed by youth department at that time, 1958. And I went down to, to find the Mile Miles. And they were staying against the fence in their red jackets with big double M's. 28 kids had been murdered in 1958 in gang fights. And I remember going up to one young man. His name was Israel the president of the gang, and he was very kind, shook hands, and uh, said, hey, preach, you're okay. I, he had listened to me preach for about five minutes. I went to shake hands with Nicky Cruz, and he spit on me, slapped my face, and said, go to hell. I'll never forget that stinging on my face. And I, all I could burn out, I, I don't think I did it in anger, Nicky, Jesus loves you, and walked away thinking, Lord, I know you love him, but I don't know if you can save him. He's the hardest. I don't like to be slapped. I don't like to be spit on. Nicky Cruz could get that out. It was like a stuck record, broken record. All night long, Nicky, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He hated police. He hated everybody else. Some of you have heard his testimony. Nicky, Jesus loves you. And folks, to sit in my office and look at that young man on his way to London, having reached thousands and thousands around the world, five girls... Five children, I think uh, two or three in Bible school, and all called to some kind of ministry. Nikki going on with the Lord. All I could say is, Jesus, your love finds them. Your love is everlasting. Nikki never told me, never knew what the love of Jesus was and what Christ had done for him until his little girl, his first little child, came to hear him in one of his crusades, and he was telling the story of all the terrible things he did, went home, and she wouldn't talk to him. He said, what's the matter, honey? She said, you are a bad man. I don't want to talk to you. That's not my daddy. <laughs> and it hurt him. He didn't realize till then uh, how God had changed, how the love of Jesus had manifested itself so much in his life. Sonny Arkansas, I met 28 years or, or 30 years ago down in Brooklyn under the elevated train right off the Williamsburg Bridge. And I, I went up to him in front of a pizza shop. And I, he was a drug addict just waiting for his contact. Found out his name. I said, Sonny, Jesus loves you. He said, man, get off the block. My mom's one of those hallelujah people. And she's a, one of those tongue-talking hallelujahs. You sound like one. I said, yes, I am. But I, I remember saying, Sonny, Jesus sent me down here because he loves you. Sonny had been in and out of jail, in and out of prison. His mother would see him dirty, filthy, and ragged on the street and say, Sonny, please, just come home, change your shirt, let me give you a clean meal. He said, Mama, go home. Didn't want anything to do with, with family, had no thoughts of God, been shot at, in and out of prison. But I'll never forget the day. He came remembering that invitation to come to the center, remembering that, that, just that one statement, Nikki, or rather Sonny, Jesus loves you. His love will find you. And the love of Jesus found Sonny when he came in and heard Nikki preach at our center down here in Brooklyn. And he thought that, he thought Nikki, while he was preaching, someone had gone to him, told him all about him because Nikki was preaching his life. And Sonny sunk down in his seat. Because he heard his whole story being told. And Nicky Cruz goes over to Sonny, lays hands on him and said, God, save him and call him to preach. And Sonny thought, me, preach? 
a drug addict, a killer at heart. Oh, but folks, I set my office this past week. Sonny Argonzoni is not only a pastor, he's a bishop of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. They've got churches all over America. In fact, he was in Philadelphia helping set up another one of their churches. In their, in their conferences, they have three, 4,000, all of them converted drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes. Sonny Argonzoni is a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the love of Christ was manifested in him. Now see, there are many of you here tonight. You know what I'm talking about because up, up here you fellas from, drug, from, from the drug life, alcoholics. Many of you, not even in Teen Child, maybe other programs. Some of you here may be in business. You were a drug addict, you were an alcoholic, you were drinking, you were lost, you were hopeless. But the love of Jesus Christ came to you. Manifested itself to you. How, how beautiful wasn't it, the love of Jesus when you first heard of it? What a flush of glory when you realized that in spite of what you'd done, Jesus loved you. And you rejoiced in that love. You went a long time just basking in that love. And then you started going around telling everybody how Jesus loved them. Some of you have been witnessing. You've been saved five years, ten years. But what's happened since then? Many of you have backslidden about the love of Jesus for yourself. Somehow along the line, you, you, you got the idea... That because you have allowed a coldness or a failure into your life, that you can preach Jesus and his love to others, but you can't appropriate it to yourself. Now this is where I'm going with the message tonight. I want to talk about his love for you as a Christian. His love for you as a believer and for me. You know, I was preaching a number of years ago in Harlem in a street meeting, and I was going through a very difficult time in our ministry. Very, very difficult. Gwen had cancer. And in fact, I think this was her second cancer she had back in the hospital. And I had the burden of teen challenge and it was weighing heavy on me. Traveling, trying to raise funds. Trying to keep the whole thing afloat. And centers, cities all over the country calling. And, and I was absolutely at the end of my rope at this particular time. I, I, and in, in my burden and in my struggle over, I, I got so burdened over needs, I went down to about 115 pounds. Skin and bone, it just, there was no joy because I was so burdened down by the needs of the city. And in that, I, I shut Gwen out. And in her pain, she, she, she couldn't stand being cut out from my life. It, it wasn't that, I don't, I don't think I was a bad husband or anything, but I didn't really bring her into the burden that was on my heart. I should have shared it with her. And we were going through a rather difficult time. And I remember one day just losing my temper and going off for a street meeting. And I felt so dirty and so unclean. Has that ever happened to you? Where, you know, you want God with all your heart. You love him with everything that's in you. And, and you fast, you pray, you seek him, but suddenly, there it is, just like a flood. It just comes and hits you and sweeps you off your feet. You lose your temper, you do something stupid, and you feel dirty and unclean and filthy. And I had to go up into Harlem, and I'm standing there in my pain, and I'm preaching my heart out. Jesus loves you. I don't care what you did. Drugs, alcohol, prostitute. Come on up, Jesus loves you. Give your heart to him. And after I preached this profound message, I thought, how Jesus could love anybody on the streets. I'm standing there after the meeting in despair watching drug addicts and alcoholics with our personal workers drinking in the love of Jesus. And suddenly, in my despair, my head down, feeling so low, the Holy Spirit said to me, David, why don't you appropriate some of that love you've been preaching for yourself? Why don't you let me love you? What gives you the idea that you can just preach it and not practice it, not appropriate it to yourself? And friends, from that day to this, there are many times I've had to just step back and say, Jesus, I've been out preaching it. I tell the whole world that you can save body, anybody from anything. Now, Jesus, come and love me. Amen. Love me. I remember one time when uh, one of Gwen's last uh, times in the hospital, she was so wiped out. She, she had uh, lupus, and had, had about 30 pounds of water on her and, and was in the hospital. 
And she, she had said, David, this is enough. I can't, after all these operations of cancer, this is just too much. And she went in the hospital just at the end of her rope. And I went to a hotel room near the hospital. And I said, oh, God, when does this ever stop? Lord, I love you. I see there's no, I can't figure it out. It, 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 she can't go through much more pain. And, you know, I said, Lord, give me something. And, you know, it's not a good idea to just say, Lord, give me something and open your Bible. Because you know where it fell? It fell in Jeremiah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know what you know, I did? I closed it and said, no, Lord, not today. I, I'm hurting enough. And you know what the Lord whispered in my heart? David, just lay still let me love you. So help me, the Holy Ghost brought Jesus his presence in that room, and he put his arms around me and began to love me. And I said, Jesus, now love Gwen. And, and then the Holy Spirit put a scripture, a Psalms, so and so and I went there. And you know what it said? He makes all wars to cease. I said, that's it. That's it. He's making all cease. I ran to the hospital. Gwen was dressed. He said, David, I'm healed. I'm getting out of here. Let's go home. I have victory. It was the love. The absolute love of Jesus Christ being manifested. The Bible said the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. You can't counsel other people that they, they are loved without appropriating that love for yourself. Now, there, there are some of you here that love Jesus dearly, but you're not persuaded that Jesus Christ loves you. You preach to others. You, you, you picture yourself, though, as... as having failed the Lord, and he's cast aside as a result of it. I want to speak directly to you tonight. I, I really believe God put this on my heart, and it's why I struggled so much with all the imps of hell to get through. But here's, I was laying on my face last night, and God began to speak clearly to me, to speak directly to those who be here tonight who felt that you've let the Lord down. You feel you've let the Lord down. You've not lived up to the standard you've heard preached in this pulpit or wherever it may be. Now, friends, if you've been coming to this church, we hold up a high standard. We preach a strong message of righteousness and holiness. And many of you feel that you can't live up to that, that you failed the Lord somehow. It's not that we've been putting a heavy trip on you. We're, we're trying to preach what we believe is the standard of the Word of God. But in your striving to be more like Jesus, you've failed the Lord. You've sinned somehow. And you sit here this, after, this evening with failure in your life. You have tripped. You have fallen. Satan has bruised your heel. Now remember, that's what the scriptures, in, in, it was originally said, that the serpent will bruise your heel. And when serpent bruises your heel, does not mean you're damned or you're lost or outside of the love of Jesus. He's bruised your heel. But there's healing for that. But now you're here tonight and you're living with guilt and condemnation. You can't see how Christ can still love you because deep in your heart you know you may have grieved the Holy Spirit and you, you somehow walk right into the devil's trap or you're still in the satanic snare. But I want you to know, friends, and listen closely, you and I were reconciled to God when we were still enemies. When we were out in sin, not even thinking of God, Jesus loved us. Let me read it to you. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, yet sinners, we weren't even thinking of him. When you were out there, do you remember when you were out there? Do you remember when you had no time of, for him? Do you remember those days? And the Lord said, even then I loved you. Even then you were reconciled to me if you would have only repented and come. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The Lord saying, if I loved you when you were out there not even thinking about me, do I not love you now when you're going through a struggle? When your heart still loves me? Now, I'm not talking about those who have just put God aside. They've given themselves over to their sin. They don't want anything to do with God. They're not interested in repentance. I'm talking about Christians and others who have backslidden somehow. In fact, the closer you get to Jesus, the least thing will seem big to you in the sight 
in your own eyes. You'll feel the grief of having grieved the Lord. Now, I don't have anything profound tonight, but I want to share you just a few things that the Holy Spirit's putting in my heart about His love. First of all, God wants us to be fully persuaded, fully persuaded that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. I want you to go. Why don't you go to Romans 8? Why don't you go to Romans 8? The 8th chapter, verse 38. Beginning to read. Do you have it? Romans 8, 38. Oh, I love the word, don't you? For I am, this is Paul speaking, I am persuaded. I'm completely convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Now that's the truth that the devil doesn't want us to be convinced of. He doesn't want you to hear that. He doesn't want you to know it. Because here, I want you to know something. If you can come, if you can get a hold of this truth, you can come through any trial. You can come through your temptation you're going through now in your trial. You can come through any failure and be more than a conqueror if you're fully persuaded that Jesus loves you. Look, look, look at verse 5. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For it's written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You're conquered through the love of Jesus Christ for you. Look at me, folks. The cry of this book is be rooted and grounded in love that you may be able to endure. Yeah. You may be able to stand in a troubled time, rooted and grounded in love. Yeah. I'm afraid we're not rooted, we're not grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. Many of us, we're afraid to appropriate it. Philippians 1, 6, don't turn, says, being confident of this, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perfect it to the day of Jesus Christ. When you came to the Lord, now listen closely to me, you came to the Lord. He decided he'd not let you go. Listen to me now. You came to the Lord, and it was known in heaven and hell and earth that Jesus paid for you with his own blood. And he put a stamp on you, and he engraved you in the palm of his hand, and he said, devil, this child belongs to me. Now, no matter what problem you're going through, no matter what failure you're at, if you'll confess it and repent, you'll come back by his love. You'll be drawn back by his love. You'll be drawn back by his precious love. He that's begun a good and work in you will perfect it till the day of Christ. You're not going to let the devil interrupt his work in you. Satan's lying to some of you right now. He's trying to tell you that Jesus has given up on you. He's telling you that Jesus is mad at you. That you're just wicked and evil, you'll never amount to anything, you'll never be holy, you'll never be clean. You can hit, hear, hear Brother Bob preach, you can hear me, hear Gary, hear one of the pastors preach and say, oh, I'll never, I can't measure up, there's no way I'm going to measure up. Everybody else is measuring up, but I'm not measuring up. Have you ever sat here thinking you're the only one going through problems, only one having a problem? Anybody sitting here right now thinking you're the only one with failure in your life? You say, but what's, are you going to do it? Uh, one of those TV evangelist things on us? No, I'm not. I'm not standing here in any known failure in my life. But there are some of you sitting here now and the devil lying to you right now. He's saying, see, you tried and you can't make it. Bob did hit this so strong this morning. And here you sit, wondering if you should even go on. We've had people leave this church. They have absolutely quit on the Lord because they say, I can't make it. I can't. I, I will never measure up to what he wants. I want you to know that God's given you a word. You can take it right to the devil and you can throw it right at him just as Jesus did in the wilderness and the devil's going to run. It's right there in the 8th chapter of Romans. Look at it. The 34th verse. 34th. Who is he that condemneth? Well, you know who that is, don't you? Were you condemned this afternoon before you came to church? Have you been sitting here doing the worship being condemned? We, we've got... We've got a Tom condemner who stands before the throne of God, accuser of the brethren, trying to accuse you, saying, you'll never make it. But who is this that condemneth? 
It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You stand right up against Satan. And you can say this with everything in you. I refuse your condemnation and your lies. Jesus paid for my sins. I repent. Jesus loves me. I, I'm on his mind right now. In fact, devil, right now when you're accusing me, he has me on his mind. He has me on his lips. He's talking to the Father about me right now. He's talking to the Father about me. This very moment, he's interceding before the Father. And you can tell the devil that. Glory be to God. And then you can quote him this scripture. I write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You go back to him. You say, Father, I've sinned. I've had four children and I never kicked them out because they failed me. I took them aside. Sometimes I had to take them to the woodshed. Sometimes I had to spank the meanness out of them. But all along they were my children and I loved them. And the only reason I spanked them was for their own good. When did Jesus throw you out? Tell me. When did he write a bill of a divorcement? Say, I divorce you. Go on out on your own. When did he do it? You can't tell me when he did that. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you to the end. I'm going through you with your troubles. I'm going through your trial. Hold fast. Now, notice a very interesting verse, Romans 8.35. Look at it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, who is a person, isn't that? And you know who that is. That's Satan. But then look, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Now, those are things. That's not a who. Those are things. Who is it that brings these things on us? Satan himself trying to bring all these things to rob us of the love of God. But I notice, look down in verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Hallelujah. Now, to separate us, who shall separate us from the love of Jesus Christ? That word separation is to isolate. In other words, to make you feel like an island of rejection. That you're not loved. And I'll tell you what the devil does. He'll first try to strip you of love of those around you. He'll try to interfere in the love of your family. Interfere in the love of your friends. And try to isolate you. In fact, the separation means to put a great gulf between it and isolate it as an island. Some of you sitting here right now knowing what that means. You have felt rejection. You felt isolated. And you, 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 feel what, you feel just what they felt in Israel. It says, but Zion has said, the Lord hath forsaken us, and my Lord hath forsaken, forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her own womb? Yea, they may forget Yet I'll not forget you. Behold, I've graven you on the palm of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. And then in Hosea it says, I will heal their backslidings. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Friends, God wants to heal every backslider here tonight. He wants to offer you his love and to heal that backsliding of your heart. Now, the Holy Spirit has really been putting me under conviction about the danger of presenting Jesus as a hard man. Do you remember that parable? There were three servants that were given talents. One was given ten, one was given five, and one was given one talent. And the man who had the one talent went and hid it in the earth. And one day the master comes and calls him to account. And he said, I, I want what I gave you. I want my return. And you know what he said? Master, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid my talent. And I was on my face before God. And the Lord was saying, David, there's something you're not hearing, you're not seeing yet. And I want to tell you, I don't believe you can be a holiness preacher of any kind. You can't be a preacher of righteousness unless you're teachable. And I'm telling you now, God's telling me I've got a lot to learn. And I confess it before you here now, and I'm not trying to be sentimental or put attention on myself. But God began to say, there's so much yet I've got to learn before I can be a shepherd to, this, to the sheep here even. All of us as pastors are, are open that God would teach us. But I got to thinking, Lord was showing me, what, what kind of teacher did this man have? The other two served the Lord with joy. 
They had no problem. They made their investment. It was a glorious experience. But this man comes and he said, boy, you're hard. And he was afraid and he hid his talent. Who was his teacher? What kind of message did he sit under that made him see Jesus as hard? Because Jesus is the master here. Brother Bob had to, he, he felt the same grief that I felt one time when, when some people that sat under his teaching had, had gone to a pastor and tried to correct him as if, you know, they knew it all now because they'd come into a holiness message. And Bob was alarmed and he got on the phone. He says, tell me, did my preaching produce that in you? And there was terror in Bob and in my own heart. Are, are, are we going to preach a message that would produce that kind of thing? Are they misjudging what is being said? And I got to thinking, Lord, what kind of a, a pastor, what kind of a teacher, what kind of a message was he sitting under that he perceives Jesus as a hard man? A Friday night, a young pastor met me back. I don't know if he's here tonight or not. And tears in his eyes, visiting from another state. And he said, Brother Dave, I've been preaching holiness in my church, and I preach it hard. And he said, the people are not receiving it, and they're leaving left and right. But I can't compromise on my message. And I felt pain in my heart, because all over the country now, there, there, there's a message of holiness coming forth. There's a message of righteousness. But folks, too many are preaching it as hardness. They're not presenting Jesus in fullness. I remember something Bob told me that changed my life. He said, David, when we preach holiness, we must never veil Christ. We must never veil the mercy of Jesus Christ. But you see, I, I don't want to be that hard man or, or, or that man that preaches a message that pictures Jesus only as a hard man because that produces fear and fear has torment and then people go and hide. Because they feel they can't make it. I don't want to be one of those preachers. You know, there are times when I, well, when I have to preach a strong message, a prophetic message especially. I know that there are some people that are out there that they're just, they, they want to say, yeah, preach it, Brother Dave. Get it. Hit it. Hit it. Hit it. It's almost like a cheering section. Hit it. And sometimes, Pastor, I know there have been times I've been carried up in it. I confessed to Bob today about a time down in Georgia. I was preaching at a camp meeting two years ago. And I, on that campground, I saw these great big satellite dishes. And you know my hatred for television. The superintendent of the movement there was great big, biggest dish I ever saw. And I'll tell you what, I got up there in that pulpit and boy, I skinned them alive. By the way, the Lord doesn't want hides. He wants souls, you know, skinning i tell you what, I thundered and I, uh, ever since I felt the pain for what I did. And later some pastors said, boy, you were hard, Brother Dave. But you know, there were some people in there just fed something in them. They wanted to hit it. They wanted hard, hard, hard. Now I'm going to tell you now, I'm not going to compromise on my message. I'm going to preach it. But there have been evangelists, you know, that have preached a hard message and you were there watching either on television or something. Yeah, there. give it to them. That's right. And he's, they'll say, I'll not compromise. I'm going to preach and tell it like it is. But I've been hearing the Holy Spirit say to me, David, how are you presenting me to the sheep? Are you showing them my mercy and my love and my long suffering along with my hatred for sin? Are you making them afraid, so afraid that they'll hide? And I want the Lord to help me preach holiness stronger than I've ever preached it, but I want to preach it with brokenness. I want to be like Paul who said, I came to you like in the tenderness of a nurse. I'm going to read it to you. Paul said, but we were gentle among you. Even as a nurse cherisheth her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted to you not the gospel of God only, but our also our very souls, because you were dear to us. I confess to you, I've never known that. I'm beginning to know it. I've never passed. I've been an evangelist. And I've thundered all over the world. I don't think I know what it's like to be a nurse, to look out over a congregation of people living in a wicked city, hurting, carrying all kinds of burdens and garbage from your past. And I, wanted, I want to see you walk in holiness. And all the past, we want to see you walk in holiness so much. 
Now, I, I can't speak for Bob. I know these men. Bob has a tender heart. Gary has a tender heart. I need this. I need to have that gentleness as a nurse, cherish of their children, not trying to spank them because there's a sickness, there's a disease, there's sin. And Paul is saying, I came to you people. My dear sheep is a nurse, cherishes her children. So being affectionate, desirous of you, we're willing to impart to you not just the gospel only, but our very souls because you're dear to us. Paul then added, we exhorted and we comforted and charged every one of you as a father to charge his children. No wonder Paul's message of holiness was received. It wasn't rejected. People didn't walk out here. Because he said, when you received this word of God, which you heard of us, you received it. Not as word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. I told this young preacher what I want to tell every preacher of righteousness and holiness in America. If you're going to be preaching a strong message, preach it through brokenness. Preach it through tears. And folks, that's what I've asked God to do for this pulpit. You may have heard people say, Times Square Church, you go down there and you just get beat. No, you don't get beat here. You won't get beaten here because God's breaking this ministry. He's breaking the hearts of the pastors, telling us that we need to be like Paul. We need to share with you as precious children, not trying to whip you, not trying to drive you, but to go to the throne of God Touch his righteousness. Touch his holiness. See a vision of Jesus so clear. And then come to you and say, here he is. In all of his love, he hates sin. And that's why we preach so strong about it. We feel his wrath against it. And we don't want you to be damned. We love you too much. But to do it as a nurse. To do it as a father with looking with love to his children. And I confess before a holy God I've not had that. I've not had that. But I want it. Make Jesus, present Jesus in his fullness. Sometimes we're like the man who was forgiven a great debt. And then we walk right out and choke somebody who's not living up to our standard. The Bible says of Jesus, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father's also merciful. That's Luke 6.35. Jesus is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father's also merciful. James said, the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. Now God's showing me. He's just pounding in me with love. He, he'd been speaking all week to me, so strong. How serious this matter is, is how, of how we present Jesus to the world. How we present him. Paul said, we are ambassadors for Christ. You know what that means? We represent him. The only thing the world's going to see of Jesus is what we show it. What we show the world of him. There, there's a, down in Brazil, I think it's in Brasilia, there's a cathedral, and there's a, a, one of those uh, glass windows, colored glass, leaded glass windows, and it's, it's, it's Jesus. You see all these people kneeling before him, and Jesus is standing with a great big club in his hand, ready to smite them. And that's their vision of Jesus. That's a perverted view of Jesus. And, and, and those people come there with that great fear of this man in heaven with a club over their head. God's word says he is very pitiful and of tender mercies. And he's saying if you're going to witness out in the street or you're going to counsel anybody, if you're going to talk to people about Jesus, you've got to be a faithful ambassador. You've got to represent me for my, who, who I really am. And what, what the word says, be, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Be pitiful, be courteous. First Peter 3 8. Do you know, much of the street preaching here in New York City is very discourteous. Very discourteous. It's confrontational. 
It's mean. Sometimes it's ugly. I, I, I would imagine we've got 10, 15 street preachers here tonight. But if you're a street preacher, or if you're a witness, or you are a counselor, you've got to understand what the Holy Spirit's saying tonight. Be careful. This is an awesome responsibility. How you present Jesus. Are you presenting him in his fullness? Or are you just showing one side of him? You know, uh, Steve and I were walking down 42nd Street a few weeks ago. And Steve was carrying a briefcase. And this street preacher, God bless his heart, up in the 42nd Street here in Broadway. He stopped. We, we, we just, I just stopped to listen. And he said, look at this. Two, me and Steve... Two computer junkies. They got their computer with them. They're so hooked on computers. You know what's in that box? A microphone. This microphone I have right here. With a big box that we carried in. Computer junkies. They're so wrapped up in the world. I mean, he scolded us. To hear that, dear brother, we were headed right down to hell. <laughs> Sliding right down on our computer. We, we were tempted to open the box. What, what, what are you telling them out there? You're shaking an accusing finger in their face. And this Lord who is very pitiful of tender mercies, are you making him out to be a monster? Are you? I don't want to misrepresent Jesus anymore. Be ye also pitiful. Be courteous. Now, look, the Bible said those who sin must be rebuked before all. That's 1 Timothy 5.20. The Bible said we are to exhort and rebuke with all authority, Titus 2.15. Unruly mouths must be stopped. You've got to rebuke them sharply, Titus 1.13. But we're also commanded to rebuke with all long-suffering. Now, that word long-suffering means very lenient, patient, and understanding. You know what the Scripture said? Street preachers, listen. Witnesses, listen. Counselors, listen. Preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, which means counsel, with all long-suffering. You're to do it, but you're to do it with pity, compassion, and long-suffering. Paul preached with that long-suffering. He said, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long-suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Do you know that you're a pattern of his long-suffering? Come on now, tell me it wasn't his long suffering that found you. How patient has he been with you? That, that's what God told me about television too. You know, last time I talked about television here, I did it with the tears in my eyes. I did it with a broken heart. And if I ever tell you again, God hates it, I'm going to tell it to you because I love you and I'm not trying to rail against you. But I, I've got to tell you right now, if it weren't for the long suffering of Jesus, I wouldn't be standing in this pulpit now. Folks, somewhere along the line, uh, I, I would have turned my back somehow, not on the Lord, but something would have crept in. My family would have been disintegrated and everything else, but for the long suffering. I stand here like Paul is a pattern of the patience and the long suffering of Jesus Christ. How long he bore with some of my foolishness. How long he put up with me. And yet he brought me back to this place and I stand now in his holy freedom. How patient he's been with you. Why will you not be patient with others then? Why will you not be patient with those that you deal with all around you? Now, truthfully, the love of Jesus never gives up on people. I want to show it to you, Revelation 3.15. Revelation 3.15. I'm not going to preach much longer. Revelation 3.15. You, you know this, he's talking about the Laodicean church. Don't you know that's the backslidden church? That's the harlot church? Look at verse... Revelation 3.15, the Lord is saying, And I know thy works, speaking the Laodicean church, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would you were either cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and not cold or hot, I'll spew you out of my mouth, because thou sayest I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You don't know that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I'd look this way for just a minute, if you will, please. You, you see... Jesus standing at the door. Well, if I, would you just look at verse 20. He's already told me he's going to spew them out of his mouth, hasn't he? 
Now look what he said. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Listen very closely to me now. It'd be easy. And I, I think there was a time in my ministry I could have stood in a pulpit and I, I, I would have said something like this. Look, there it is in black and white. I'm going to spill you out of my mouth. Folks, is it in your Bible? There it is. In black and white, I'll spill you out of my mouth. You're compromised, you're backslided, you're naked, you're cold, you're lost, you're undone. And God said, I'll spill you out of my mouth. And I had been preaching the truth halfway. Because look at verse 18. There's Jesus. He doesn't want them to be spewed out of his mouth. Look, he's counseled them. He said, please buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. He doesn't want them to be poor in spirit. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. He's trying to cover their shame. He's not trying to expose anything. He's trying to cover it by his blood. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. And for as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. He's offering mercy. He's offering grace. And see, if I had just come and preached, I'll spill you out of my mouth, I would have had scripture to prove it. But I would not have preached Jesus in his fullness. I would have missed. Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. Before I'll spill you out of my mouth, I'm going to knock on your door. Because I really don't want to spill my mouth. I want to sit down and eat with you. I don't want you standing naked before the world. I want you covered. But see, we give up on our weak brethren. If we're working with people and they fail us, especially after the second or the third time, it usually, I know it's, I've said it so many times. Look, I've tried. I can't waste any more time. He doesn't want God. He knows where I'm at if he wants the Lord. I'll be here, but I'm not going out of my way. I don't think you're going to make it anyhow. Have you said that about your husband or your wife? I don't know what it's going to take. I've prayed and I'm tired of praying. Man, I've done everything I know how to do. There's nothing left. And I mean, most people, do. we just give up on people. I'm so glad Jesus doesn't. I'm so glad Jesus didn't give up on Peter. Peter didn't deny him once. He didn't deny him twice. He, didn't, he denied him three times. He cursed him. He said, I don't even know the man. I don't know him. He told me Satan was after me to try to sift me. He warned me. I heard the word, I was warned, and yet even in spite of the word that I heard, I've been sitting under this kind of ministry, and I went right out and I did something to grieve my Lord. How could I have done it? Does that sound familiar? Come on. Amen. Don't hide. The Holy Spirit knows where you're at. Oh, but Peter, Peter remembers something Jesus said. And I can, Peter says, oh, the look in his eyes, I'll never forget that look. What was that look? It was a look of love. Because Jesus said, Peter, <laughs> i got to read it to you. Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. You know what, Peter? You know what brought him back? I'm convinced of it. Peter's weeping over the hilltops. He's walking up and down the hillside of Judea and said, I've denied him. I've sinned. <laughs> I've grieved the Lord. I shouldn't have done it. I'm his servant. I've preached his gospel. I've laid hands on the sick. I let him down. Oh, but he said something to me. He said he's going to pray for me. He's praying for me. He's praying for me right now. He's praying for me. Do you know that he's doing that right now for you? And for me, he's before the Father. He's praying for us just like he prayed for Peter. And then Peter remembers something else. Jesus said... I'm going to be converted. I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to be an example to my brothers. Strengthen your brothers. I'm going to be an example of his grace. Can't you say that right now to yourself and to the devil and the whole world? Yes, I've grieved him. I've sinned, but I hate it. I despise it. And I know he's interceding for me right now. And he's saying, you come back to me, and when you're converted, I'm going to make you stronger, and I'm going to use you. You're going to be a testimony to me and to your brothers. Hallelujah. 
What kind of love is that? I'm going to close in just a minute. You remember, you remember the prodigal son who just took his belongings and went off and he wound up in a pig pen eating the husk of the pigs? You ever been there? Far, some of you are there. I, I have to close now, but this is where the Holy Spirit has brought me for tonight. Please hear me, and I don't, I'm not going to do it psychologically or sentimentally or anything else, but I ask the love of Jesus to make it real. Do you know that whole time that prodigal son was out there feeding the pigs? What was his father? His father was looking for him, waiting for him. See, the Lord won't force himself on you, but he's waiting. All you have to do is like the prodigal son, come to the end of yourself, say, look, I've had it. I can't carry this guilt, this condemnation. And more than that, my father has everything that I need. Do you know that father was praying for that son? According to the scripture, if you put everything else together, you, you see the picture, the composite picture. And one day he gets up and he comes back. And that's what God wants you to do tonight. You in the balcony here, down on the main floor, you have that burden on you. You've slipped away from the Lord. Your heart's grown cold. You're under condemnation and guilt. Lord said neither. Do. He, he told the woman, I don't condemn you. Go sin no more. Where are your accusers? He's not your accuser tonight. He's your savior. He's your savior. So this, this boy gets up and he heads back home. And before he even gets there, his father sees him and runs after him. You know, the, that's Jesus. That he comes after you, take one step to him, and I mean he'll come to you. The father didn't go up to him and says, you spent every, look at it, I told you it happened. I knew you'd do it. There was a streak in you, it's been there all the time. You're a brother, you're older brother, you ought to be like him. Stayed right here faithful. Well, that's not what he told him. What'd he do? He fell on his neck and kissed him. He saw his dirty clothes and he said to his servants, take those clothes, put new clothes on his back. Lord said, I'm going to make you a righteous person. I'm going to clean you up. The Lord's master said, take off those filthy shoes. He put new shoes on him. And the, the, the boy said, but I'm not worthy. Master, Father, I failed you. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against God. I'm not worthy. In other words, Lord, let me stay out here till I work my way in. I've got to earn your respect now. No, the father said, right into the house. And he had a feast with him. Put on a feast. Why? Because the prodigal son could say, I've sinned against God, I've sinned against you, and I'm not worthy. And when you come to that place, then you come to the feast. He doesn't want you just camping outside. He wants you at his table tonight. Kill the fatted calf. and says, come on home. My son who is dead is alive again. Hallelujah. Some of you have been dead. God's going to resurrect you tonight. Hallelujah. Well, I told you, it's very simple. Per, bow your heads. Oh, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Show us your love tonight. How you're reaching out in love tonight to say, if you'll get up out of your despair, if you just get up out of your flesh, get up out of this thing that has a hold of you and come to me I'll receive you I'll make you righteous all you have to do is get up and come come home come home come home Lord Jesus I feel your love tonight for this people truly you love us you love us with an undying love Holy Spirit, just come and put your arms around the sinner here tonight. Put your arms around the backslider. Put your arms around those that are struggling with the weight, saying, I can't take it anymore. I, I'm bound by this thing and I want to be free and I don't know how to get free. Lord, put your arms around them and by your Spirit, just draw them. And tonight, break every chain that binds them and set them free. If God, by His Spirit, touched you tonight, and the Holy Spirit has said, this message is for you, and you've, you've been backslidden in heart, or you're carrying a load of sin or guilt or a habit, and you say, Brother, I want to come home. I've got to come. I need His love tonight. 
I'm tired of sin. I want to repent, but I want to be restored to His love. Let's all stand, please, so people can get out of the aisles. You really do reap what you sow. Amen. Good and bad. You'd be surprised we're going to talk a lot about the good tonight as well as the bad. Why don't you go to Matthew, the 25th chapter, if you will, please. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Let's begin reading at the 14th verse. Very familiar. Verse 14, very familiar. The kingdom of heaven is of a man traveling into a far country. He called his servants and delivered unto them his goods. To one he gave five talents, to another two, another one. To every man according to his several ability, he straightway took his journey. When he received, he had received the five talents, went and traded the same, made them another five talents. Likewise also, he that received two, he gained another two. The one who received the one, of course, remember what he did, he digged into the earth. He had his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord, those servants come, cometh and reckoneth with them. He that received five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five. Behold, I have gained beside five more. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful of a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter in the joy of the Lord. He that received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two. I've gained two more. The Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He had received the one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew thee, thou art a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, together without straw. I was afraid, I hid it in the earth, there thou hast that is thine. The Lord said unto him, You wicked, slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I sow not, together where I have not straw. You should have, therefore, have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I would have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him, said ten. And, of course, he was cast into outer darkness. Very familiar scripture. That has to do with reaping and sowing. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for Jesus. Holy Spirit, I need to be quickened. Holy Ghost, come and quicken my body. Let me speak as the oracle of God tonight. Lord, don't let anybody stay in this service tonight without being moved by the Holy Ghost, changed by the word of the Lord. Quicken us, Lord. Sanctify me. I take your authority, Jesus, over every demon power, every prince upon him, power of darkness, that nothing in this house can disturb or, or uh, hinder the word of the Lord from going forth, quickened by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this matter of sowing and reaping, you know, goes two ways. It's both good and bad. You know, all, all my life and all your life, you, Christian life, you've heard this. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, that has a bad connotation, but it also has a good connotation. In fact, probably most of my message tonight will deal with the good connotation. The Bible said, in due season, you shall reap if you faint not. Now, there is a sowing to the flesh. There's a sowing to the flesh that brings a terrible, awful harvest. How many people do you know that sowed to the flesh? And you know, you look at their life and they are reaping on all sides. Have you ever seen a day where there's been such awful reaping? Such terrible reaping for sins that have been sown? Uh, physical problems, mental problems, family problems on all sides. People who have been sowing to the flesh and sowing to the flesh. And now they are reaping what they have sown. It's an awful harvest. You can see the effects of the sowing to the flesh here in the United States. Let, let's talk about what America's reaping now. Let's talk about the nation first, not just individuals, but corporately as, as a nation. Look what we are sowing, for example, in our public schools. You know, all through New York now, uh, the schools are in absolute chaos. We have teachers that are afraid to go into the classroom anymore. Let me remind you that in 1940, that's just one generation, in 1940, 
all classes opened with prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. They would pray first and then pledge allegiance to the American flag. But there was prayer every morning in school. That was one generation ago. God's blessing was asked upon the school. They prayed for the principal. They prayed for their teachers. And over the PA system, there was public prayer. School was open with public prayer. And they said, one nation under God. And folks, he honored that. He honored our classrooms. This nation was number one in education. I don't even know where it is now. Many nations have passed us. Many of our kids can't even read or write anymore. In 1940, just a generation ago, the top seven disciplinary problems in our schools were as follows. The number one problem in school in 1940s, right up to 1950, number one problem was talking in class. Number two was chewing gum. Number three was making noises. Number four, running in the halls. Number five, cutting in line. Number six, improper clothing. Number seven, not taking out the garbage. Not disposing of the garbage properly. Leaving apples on the desk, for example. Now, today, the most recent survey, let me give you the top seven disciplinary problems in our American schools today. Since we took God out, we took prayer out, we took the Bible out. We want nothing to do with God. We chased him out. We want nothing that resembles God in our schools. Now, when I say we, we're talking about the liberal mind. We're talking about the godless people who have pushed this upon our society. The number one problem in our schools today, rape. Number two, and this, this is documented, <coughs> robbery. Number three, assault. Number four, burglary. Number five, arson. Number six, bombing. Number seven, murder. That's one generation, folks. We are reaping. All of these are related to drug abuse. Every one of these problems have to do with young people that are on drugs. I don't know if you know that in Brook, up in the Bronx, in one of the schools just recently, a seven-year-old boy in first grade came and laid on his desk a whole bag of marijuana. He was going to pass it out to his classmates. Seven years old in first grade with a bag of marijuana. I don't even know where he got it. I don't know the whole story. But it all has to do with drug-related problems. Well, we wanted God out. We let the devil in. It's payday. We are reaping in America in our schools what has been sowed to the flesh. They're calling now uh, for free condom uh, distribution in our schools, even to 7th and 8th graders. And now, you know what the latest, latest thing is now? Condom vending machines in all of our schools. Supposedly to protect our young people from AIDS. But you know what that's saying to our young people? We condone your sex. We know you're going to do it, so just protect yourself. What an awful, awful harvest that we are paying right now. One half of all the births in our city now are illegitimate. 50% of all the babies born to our young ladies now are illegitimate. One half of all the children born. The script, according to the latest report, one-fourth of all pregnancies are now being aborted. Every one-fourth of all pregnancies are ending in abortion. Been 22 million abortions already, and some believe it may be 25 million abortions, and many of them just girls going without their parents even knowing it. In just one generation, we've come from chewing gum to machine guns. Now, are you understanding how far we've gone and what kind of thing we have? In a Bronx school, a student brought a Uzi machine gun to class, hidden under his jacket, loaded. There are reports of teachers now all over New York and in all of our schools, even in country schools now, have, saying there's no uh, respect for authority. They curse the teachers. I don't know if you heard now that... Uh, uh, this past week, two days ago, I think it was, uh, the Pope was in, in uh, Germany, in East Berlin, and hundreds of young people were cursing. They were stripping off their clothes, and they were throwing paint bombs at his Pope mobile. For first time, any kind of reception like that, young people, wild and absolutely, uh, and, and these were young people who were admirers of Hitler. Right out of school, out onto the streets, no respect for any authority. Then, of course, we, we they called 
uh, 20 years ago, almost 30 years ago, for a sex revolution in the United States. The liberal press and, and backslidden theologians called for a new day of sexual freedom. They said, we don't want any more of your Puritan moral standards. I said, anything goes between two mutually consenting adults. Anything goes if you're adult and you consent, anything goes. And so now we have homosexuals that have come out of the closet, who were in the closet for many, many hundreds of years now, out of the closet, on the streets, parading, and now moving into the schools to teach their lifestyle, and then taking to the streets, and now it's become in-your-face perversion. In-your-face, like it or not. They'll parade down the street and say, we'll get your kids, like it or not. Some harvest we've paid, some payday, now it's payday with AIDS. Oh, God help us. The new disease is now 4 million cases of chlamydia. Chlamydia shuts the womb. And it looks to me like God's going to have to shut one womb for every abortion with chlamydia. There, there's, there's a new papillion now, a new cancer, uh, a sexual cancer that is horrible. There are things that we just can't even understand. So far beyond our comprehension. Payday. Syphilis is returning now to the, to, to, to the uh, sexual generation. This uh, revolution, sex revolution, has brought back syphilis. I have a Christian doctor who's on our board. He was here last Sunday sitting on the platform. And Dr. Rice said, Pastor Dave, he said, just 15 years ago, I had to give 600,000 units of penicillin, 600,000 units for syphilis. He said, today, I have to give 4,800,000 units, and it still doesn't kill this virus. Think of it, 4,800,000 units, and it doesn't touch it because it's, it, it, it's uh, uh, becoming absolutely uh, immune. To penicillin. And now with his uh, papilloma, it's called, virus. That's attacking many young women especially. And there's no end in sight. Almost every time you pick up the paper anymore, there's some new disease. Sexually transmitted disease. Folks, it's payday. We are reaping what we have sown to the flesh in our society. Now, what does this word mean? You reap what you sow. <clears throat> Folks, the... The Lord means that. The Bible means that. Look what we are reaping with our children now when we allow child pornography. It is allowed. Child pornography is allowed. It's, it, it's, it's rife all over the United States now. And now, listen to me, folks. In the past 10 years, one of the number one problems in our society is incest. And primarily parents molesting their own children. Now, we don't like to hear these things, but folks, that is the, what has happened to our society. It's payday. You can't keep feeding this garbage into the minds of the American society without reaping in it. What we, what we are reaping right now. We've become such a degenerate nation of, of some parents that are like wild animals and they're like beasts. Folks, I can't imagine a father or a mother raping their own child. It's a, that has to be a beast. Where does that come from? We are reaping what we have sown in what we call sexual freedom. And now, folks, we're about to reap another kind of harvest, and that's an economic crash because we have become a greedy nation. Wall Street right here is the, the, the bed, the hotbed of all of this greed. Everybody trying to get their hands on one big last killing and what's happened folks L let me let me I quote you something I just read in a newspaper by uh, the Federal Reserve officer he said don't worry about multi-billion takeovers now with their 10 to 1 debt load he said there's too many other unknown forces out there now folks out there has become a term Every politician understands it. Every economist understands out there is a whole unknown thing about society, about our economy. Nobody even knows where it's going. Nobody can explain what's happening. One day, and I've been warning about it for a long time now, one day, overnight, 
And I've told you the vision I've had repeated at least five times. I've seen, I don't know who the president is. I just see his chair. He's turned his seat toward the window and he's got all of his cabinet and all of his counselors in the room. And he turns and he says, how did it happen? And every man in the room has his head down and everybody's shaking his head. Nobody in the room can explain what happened. And the president is saying, what happened? How did it happen? Folks, it's going to happen and nobody's going to be able to explain it because it's payday. We have been reaping greed uh, or sowing greed and we're going to reap a harvest. God, God has warned us and he's given us many, many opportunities to repent. But there's been no repenting. The Bible makes it very, very clear that we are going to suffer economically. <clears throat> there's a good side to this now. That's the bad side that I've just given to you. I hope you're ready for the good side. The Bible said, you reap what you sow. But he said, if you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap a wonderful harvest. Hallelujah. Uh, th th this whole story in, in uh, Matthew, the story that we just read to you, we went through it. I want to show you that the Lord is going to have a great host of willing sowers in the last days. How many believe that? God is going to have a whole host. He's going to have an army of people that are going to go out and sow the good seed. And before Jesus comes, there's going to be a great harvest. There's going to be a great harvest before Jesus comes. Now, this parable proves to me that God is going to have in the last day those who are bearing fruit. Now, often we focus on this one servant who goes out and he wraps his, his uh, talent in a napkin. He wraps it all up and buries it. And many people think the church is going to be like that, that the, there's going to be so much sin, there's going to be so much wickedness, and all these things we talked about, the church is going to be downcast, Christians are going to be defeated, and they're just going to take their talent and bury it out of fear. This man said he's afraid, and he, he buried his talent. And people have the concept that the church of Jesus Christ is going to be so inundated with all kinds of problems that the cities are going to become so wicked and so violent, that is true. But this parable, if you see it in the spirit, is saying, no, that, there, that the majority in God's house, in the remnant, the holy remnant, are going to be bearing great fruit. They're going to be coming with their arms full. They're going to be joyful. They're going to serve the Lord with gladness. The Bible said these men said, I have gained, I have gained. There's going to be gain. Hallelujah. The closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the more fruitful Times Square Church ought to be. And I believe will be as the days come. The, the, you know, the Lord is not affected. The kingdom of God is not affected by the economy. The kingdom of God is not affected by anything the devil does. The devil can do everything he wants to. He can do all the demons of hell out. He can come down with great wrath. But that does not hinder in one iota the plan of God. God's plan is not going to be affected by it. Hallelujah. I was looking at this this afternoon in preparing for the service tonight. Our, our Lord is the one who's, the Bible says, who's traveling to a far country. And after a long time, he's going to return. And the talent here represents the measure of grace and revelation of Jesus Christ. Some One man was given a great revelation of Jesus. He was given five talents. Another was given two talents. Not, not as much revelation, but it was the true revelation of the grace of God. And the other was given a measure of the grace and revelation of Jesus. He buries his. But what happens? God says in the last days, he's trying to tell us that in the last days, he's going to have a people who trust him. He's going to have a people who are joyful in him. They know that he's not a hard taskmaster. If you think our God's a hard taskmaster, you're serving the wrong God. You have the wrong image. And that's why you bury your talent. That's why you have such a poor revelation of who Jesus is. Because you have a perverted view. You have never seen his grace and his mercy and his love for a lost humanity. Folks, I'm telling you, God is, 
God is absolutely, totally committed to saving a people. Do you understand he's committed to saving and keeping you from the power of the devil? He's committed to bringing you to his throne room. He's committed to presenting to you to the Father without blame, blameless before the Father. He's committed himself to that. He's committed himself that there is going to be a harvest in the last days. Hallelujah. So you can look at what the homosexual uh, uh, community is doing and, and, and say that doesn't concern the kingdom of God and his program. You can look at what is happening to our schools and you can grieve over it, you can pray about it, but that's not going to hinder the program of God. And, and I was, I've been very concerned about our young generation. We pray for our teenagers and that, but I'm going to show you in just a minute what God prophesied is going to happen. He, he, he's not going to let this generation be lost. There are going to be thousands and thousands of Christian young people in the last day coming to the Lord. Let me ask you, do you believe that in the last day just before Jesus comes, there's going to be uh, a clearer and clearer vision of who Jesus is? Do you really believe what the scripture says that uh, though hell rages, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. That's the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God is not affected by demons or by the economy, by communism, by violence, or any world conditions. Hallelujah. This parable proves that God will have a last day army. Amen. Amen. I said a last day army prepared. I want to show you a prophecy. Now, before I turn there, remember, Jesus quoted this prophecy. Paul quoted it, and it's quoted seven times in the New Testament. So clearly, this is a last day prophecy of conditions in the church just before Jesus comes. Now, if this is good news. Go to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. I'm going to show you a prophecy about our young people. If you're a teenager tonight, oh, ask God to let this lay hold of you tonight. In fact, if you're under 25, I'd say that's young. At my age, anything is young. Martin Luther said of this uh, chapter, a glorious prophecy concerning the kingdom of Christ. It ought to be one of the nearest, dearest scriptures to everyone in the church. One of the dearest, most precious chapters of prophecy in the Bible. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. What's God, God going to do with the enemies of Jesus? They're going to be under his feet. That's the prophecy. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Who is the rod of his strength? That's Jesus. Hallelujah. In the midst of thine enemies. To rule. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now let me show you what this means. Follow me if you will, please. Amen. There's a day of his power. Look this way, please. The Bible says there's going to be a day of his power. Now, we know there's been a day of his power ever since Jesus arrived, ever since he was on this earth and ascended the Father. It's been the day of his power. He's shown his power for the last 2,000 years. But remember how God showed his power in, Israel, uh, in Egypt? First of all, he, he, he shook the earth, and then he literally shook the heavens with thunder and with darkness. And he kept increasing the day of his power and increasing it. And what did he do? A final rage of death to the firstborn. There was a burst of power. And do you know what the Lord said he's going to do? He's been shaking everything. But he said there's going to be one last shaking. He said, I'm going to shake everything. There's going to be a day of his power. And we're living in that day of his power. And he said, and in the day of his power, when God comes down to start dealing with his enemies. And folks, he is dealing with his enemies now. Oh, yes. Even presidents of the United States 
They can hide and hide. It, but if, 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 if God says it's time, he exposes it. That was Watergate, for example. And, and, and no matter who's in Washington, you can't hide from God. You can't hide. I don't care who it is, Republican, Democrat. You can't hide from God. God God's going to have his way. You're, you, some of you are too, too young to remember Khrushchev. He came to the United Nations here and, and sat there and took off his shoes and banged it and said, we're going to bury you. Well, he's, he's, he's in a grave and he's dust now. All of these world leaders, these, these, these dictators, God just snaps his finger, blows on dust. He said that the nation of the world, a drop of dust in a bucket. He has all power and all authority. And folks, we're living the day of his power. When the Holy Ghost came, that was the day of his power. And he's increasing his power because he's about to come. And he said, in that time, my people are going to be willing. Hallelujah. He said, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised yet once more, I'll shake not on the earth, but the heaven. My people shall be willing. Hallelujah. Now, the scripture says, it's, this people, this prophecy says that they're going to see the beauty of holiness. Now, folks, you've got to stop here and listen to me, because God really spoke this to my heart. There, there are going to be people in the last time that don't feel that holiness is a burden. That, that you know, this reproof and all of this, oh, no, I can't live like that. God says there are going to be a people so willing and have such a heart for him that holiness is going to become a beauty to them. It's going to be a joy, a wonderful experience. And, and they're going to thank God for reproof that provokes them to righteousness. Because they're going to say, uh, and, and really from their heart they see these are beautiful words because it produces a beautiful effect in my life. It's producing righteousness. My people, he said, I'm going to come in power and it's going to be my day of power and in my day of power, I'm going to have a people. God's not going to send angels down to do his work. He's got us to do it. And he said, I'm going to make you willing. Not I'm going to make you willing to go out and sow the revelation I gave you of my heart and of my son. You're going to, folks, we're going to have people going around who know Jesus in such an intimate, personal way that everywhere they go, that's the witness. They're going to say, I know you know Jesus. They can see it on your countenance. Everything about you is the revelation of Jesus. You're not going out with four little scriptures. You're not going out with some little thing that you have learned to quote. You're not just mouthing scriptures. You are a living testimony of who Jesus is. And the, the Bible says you're going to have such a beauty about you. It's going to be the beauty of holiness that you fully accept you know, we've got preachers in the pulpit screaming, we don't live by law anymore. The law is dead. It's gone. It's all grace. Yes, it is grace. But he said, I'll put the law in your hearts. You will love to serve me. You will love to fulfill my law because I'm going to give you the power to do it. Hallelujah. Folks, that, that, that's a wonderful church when people are serving the Lord just because they love him. Because there's a beauty in just walking with him. Hallelujah. That helps make you willing to obey him. Now, it says in verse 3, Thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now, folks, I'm not the only one that saw this. I was surprised that uh, Jonathan Edwards, Calvin, Rogers, and some of the great uh, prophets of God and writers from way back for the last 300 years, I, I, I thought I had some new revelation. You know, when you go out, in the morning, and you see the dew on the grass. Now, you'd have to go to Central Park in New York to see that. <laughs> Anybody been in Central Park when the dew comes? Folks, I was raised in the country. And when you go out in the early morning and you look at the dew, it's like millions and millions of diamonds, those little drops of dew. And he says, God says, I'm going to have the dew of youth. I'm going to have a whole sea of diamonds. I'm going to have the youth. And that's before he comes. It's going to be too late after he comes. This prophecy is being fulfilled in these our very days. They're going to be fulfilled, and I believe it with all my heart. God is going to have the dew of the youth. 
These are his diamonds. And that's exactly, exactly, it, it, and here's the meaning. These are young converts, servants of the Lord. They shall be like beads as numerous as drops of the morning dew. That's the meaning. As numerous as the drops of the morning dew. Folks, you don't go out in, in a morning in the field when the dew comes and just see a drop here and a drop there. The fields are covered with these diamonds. They sparkle in the sun. When the sun comes, they just sparkle. Has anybody seen that? Is, am I the only? Okay. All right. I thought I was the only one who saw that. Hallelujah. There is absolutely nothing in heaven or earth that's going to stop this last day harvest. Now, there's, there's something unique and special about these last day servants. This, this, these, these young people, especially, that God is calling and these willing people, they're not going to be afraid to plow in the cold. Your scripture says the sluggard, that's the lazy Christian, he will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. You know who these people are? They're not going to have anything. It's harvest time. And the Bible says there's going to be some. There are going to be churches just dead. There are going to be churches in this city while we are packed and our alders are filled and people getting saved. Your families and all over. The dew is falling everywhere and the diamonds are shining. And God's people are willing in a day of power. There are going to be people saying, oh, it's too cold out there. You know, the, the, the demon powers are out there. The, 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 the rapists and, and uh, uh, people don't want God. You know, when I came to New York City and talked to some pastors about my vision of coming here into Times Square Church, they said, they don't want God here. I've been here 15, 20 years, nothing happens. You can't have any church Sunday night. It's too cold, you know. People are not going to come out. People are not going the, the, the subways are so dangerous. The city's getting so wild. They're not going to come to it. They might come Sunday morning and that's it. Everywhere I got, you can't do it. Can't do it. It's too cold. Too cold. I don't mean, you know, the weather, but I'm, that, that, that's what it means. It's too hard. It's too difficult. It can't happen. I got so sick and tired of that. I got so sick and tired of that everywhere I went. If I listened to what I heard from my minister friends, God bless them. I'd have never come to New York. They about tried to scare me to death. One pastor hadn't seen a soul saved in 10 years. At least that's the impression I got. Death everywhere. It's too cold to plow. God says, you go out in the cold and you plow. Doesn't matter what the weather is. Doesn't matter what people say. You go and plow and you sow your seed. I'm going to give you a harvest. Hallelujah. They said, oh, you, when I first came here, drug, drug addicts can't be changed. Nobody can change. Drug addicts. At, at, when I first came to New York, there were, there were no ministries on drugs. In the United States, we were one of the first to, to prove to the world that Jesus could save a drug addict. It, up to that time, it was hopeless. Because at that time, in 1958, there was no heroin. Very little. Most of it was pot. Then in 19, after we were here about a year, all the, the drug addict, all, all the gang leaders I was working with, I was preaching to gangs first because there, wasn't, there were no drug addicts on the street. Just musicians smoking pot and a few things. 1958, 1960, heroin hit. And all these... Gang members that I was working with were on the streets. Now, they weren't fighting. They were just trying to get money to support their habit. And I noticed kids out in, in the cold of night, uh, you know, it was zero out. And they had no jackets on. They didn't feel the cold. And I was figuring out, man, these, these kids don't even feel the weather. I went up to one, so it's only, he said, I'm high, I'm high. He couldn't feel the weather. And, 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 and I began to suddenly see these kids vomiting and laying all over. And suddenly, I didn't know anything about drugs, but nobody, nobody believed then. Not even the church believed that a drug addict could be saved. Too cold to plow. God said, I'll save them. And folks, thousands and thousands have been saved now all over the world. Hallelujah. I'll tell you something else. 
these willing servants are not going to be afraid of the lion out there roaring. The scripture says the slothful or lazy Christian saith, there's a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. Proverbs 22, 13. Proverbs 26, 13. The slothful man says, there's a lion out there in the way. A lion is laying and waiting in the street. Devil's too powerful, they say. He's got the whole world in his hands. You know that song, he's got the whole world in his hands. They're talking about the devil. I don't believe that, but if God has the whole world in his hands. You know what the Lord said? Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city. Bring in hither the poor, the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. Bring them in. He said, don't be afraid of the lion. Uh, some of you remember uh, about two years ago, there, there was so much talk about crime in the subways and everything. I got to thinking, boy, one of these days it might affect our uh, people won't come on Sunday nights and Tuesday nights. They only come Sunday morning because of the crime. And so <clears throat> on a Tuesday night or Friday night, I opened up the microphone and I, I said, if the Lord's delivered you, from a, you know, somebody tried to attack you and everything, come up and tell us about it. And I'll tell you what, I, I heard one after another. We were here for about an hour, remember, hearing testimony after testimony of people who've been delivered. One lady, she said, I carry my, I don't know if she's here tonight or not, I carry my Bible in the subway. Anybody come around to hit me, she said, I'll use this in my club. This is my club. <laughs> And I, I had, I had sisters all over the church said, brother, Dave, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I was the only one afraid. <laughs> Nobody else. How many are not afraid of the lion out in the street? Come on now. Not afraid of the lion out in the street. He said, go out into the streets and lanes of the city. He didn't say, go out in the lanes of the, except New York City in 1995. <laughs> They'd go out quickly in the streets and bring in the hit of the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. But you know, there's a growing number of Christians, and I'm going to preach about five more minutes. There's a number of Christians now that are he heading for the hills. They're hiding. In fact, I get letters now from people on my mailing list that say, Brother Dave, and they say, I'm prophesying to you. I heard from the Lord. You have to get out of New York City quickly. You've got about six months left. It's going to be bombed. I've got others saying, Brother Wilkerson, God's telling everybody to flee to the hills, go to Montana, go to Wyoming, go somewhere and get a farm. There's a book just been written, and it's, it's by a Christian who's a member of the Coalition on Revival. And let me, let me read to you what he says Christians have to do now. They have to go out in the country and get at least five acres. You have to have $500 of silver U.S. dimes, a six-month supply of dehydrated food, a home water filter system, water storage facilities, chemical toilet, kerosene heater and lamps, survival stove, fire extinguisher, at least one forty-five Colt automatic pistol. This is a, this is a in fact. This man's a preacher who wrote the book. You've got to have a thirty aught six rifle with a four time scope, a twelve gauge shotgun with pump action. You you must have ammunition. 500 rounds, 22 long-range ammunition, air rifle, reloading equipment, high-quality first aid kit, battery-operated shortwave radio, citizens' band radio, 50 pounds, one can pounds of coffee for exchange. <laughs> 100 six-ounce tins of cigarette tobacco so you can trade when the crash comes. 20 pounds of inexpensive pipe tobacco, one case of expensive whiskey, preferably Jack Daniels or wild turkey. That's what it says. <laughs> 30 Mexican gold coins, five U.S. $20 gold coins. And he says the booze and the tobacco is to bribe the law, the sheriff, in time of anarchy. You bribe people. Amen. This is a Christian. This is a, a preacher. He sent me the book, and I started reading through this. I said, "I got to think. I can't find any of that in the Bible. I can't find any of that." 
My Bible says, go quickly out into the streets. Bring them in. Folks, you know where I want to be when the crash comes? Right here. With God's people. I'll tell you something. Let me tell you something. You're going to be safer here. Have you been reading the news about those people out in Montana? At a farm? With the FBI? They've got their guns, they've got their kerosene, they got all that, they're in jail! And we're here winning souls. Let me close with this. Bible said, he that seeks to save his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says they're going to cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them. While we are praising God, we're going to go out in a blaze of glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn around to these three people and say, God has everything under control. God has everything under control. Everything. Stand, please. He said, Brother Dave, if you believe hard times are coming, why aren't you storing food? I've been storing food right here. <laughs> Beloved, our security is not in guns, not in a stash of food. Our security is in our Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Beloved, he's kept us to this time, hasn't he? No matter what happens, he's going to keep his people. He's going to keep you. He's going to keep me. Hallelujah. Folks, what I'm trying to say tonight, and the last thing we'll say to you, the Lord wants you to come to church with hope. He wants you to have hope about the salvation of your family. He wants you when you walk the streets to know that angels walk with you. He wants you to know that he wants you to be absolutely fearless. And he wants you to, to, to boldly tell everybody you can about Jesus and believe, believe that God's going to give you a harvest that, that you know, many may reject it. But folks, you're going to find more and more people are open. People are hungry. They want to hear. And folks, you've got to believe what the scripture says in, in Psalm 1. I believe that with all my heart. To me, that's not theology. To me, that's not just something I read and forget. I believe that with all my heart. And that gives me hope for the young people, and not only in this church, but in this city. No matter how they curse, no matter how they drink. It may be, look, I, I've thought for a whole while we've lost the whole generation. And then I go to the word that says, no, he says he's going to have the dew of the youth. He's going to bring diamonds out of these kids. He, they're going to be diamonds that shine. Look at, look at Timothy. That's all these guys in the front rows here. These, these were guys that society and everybody else gave up on and for... For Sarah House here. And folks, we've changed the name from Hannah to Sarah. We had to because there's a whole bunch of other Hannah Houses all over the United States. And people are mailing us. We're confused by it. So it's called Hannah House. But these girls that are up here in the front, they are diamonds. But people would have thought nothing could have been done. I'll, I'll tell you something else. Up there, down here, if God can save you, he can save anybody. If he saved you, he can save anybody. If he saved me, he can save anybody. Yes, hallelujah. God, give us hope. Give us faith. We are not a defeated people. We are victorious people. God, God gave us uh, what I believe is the best theater in this city, right in the middle of Broadway. He's raised up a standard, and he is saving people left and right, people uh, from all walks of life, and he is moving by his spirit. God, help us to act and move, not in cowardice, 
not worried about a lion in the street or the coldness of conditions, but to trust him in all things. And folks, we intend to keep plowing. God sent me here to sow. And you can't sow till you plow. We've been plowing and plowing, and now we're sowing, and we're going to reap. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We don't try to pack this altar or anything else. We're just here uh, to serve God's people and to reach those who are in need and the lost. But I feel that there's some balcony in the main floor. <clears throat> and here's what the Holy Spirit put in my heart just, just a moment ago. Some of you standing here have no joy. I don't know if you lost it or you just misplaced it. But the joy of the Lord is not there. You, you, you sat and you heard the message, but you sat with a burden hanging on you. Just hanging on you. Bring that burden to the Lord now. But please don't come unless you're going to believe with me that while I pray and we pray together, that's going to be lifted from you. Because the Bible said the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I don't want you to walk out of here weak. You that have come forward, if you can look this way for just a moment, please. I am so, uh, there, there's such a joy in my heart when I know how much he loves his children. The Lord loves his people. If you can only get this down, so you have to be totally convinced that God's not mad at you. If God were mad at you, he'd cut you off long ago. We'd all been cut off. Because we deserve it, but he's a God of love and mercy and compassion. Yes, he's a holy God. He's a just God. But that whole, that, that, the wrath of God is against those who reject him. Those who reject his call, his plea, and his many, many mercies that he uh, extends to his people. But you're not that kind. You come here because you love him and you want him. And you, you want your heart given to him. Isn't that why you came? You want to give your whole heart to him? How many could say amen to that? I want to give my whole heart to the Lord. I want to hold nothing back. Now, if you have a besetting sin, often sin uh, brings condemnation, guilt, and it cuts off the joy. It's, it's hard to be in sin and have any joy. It's almost impossible. The only joy you can have if you're living in sin is a false peace and a false joy. So let the Holy Spirit bring that right out into the open and say, Lord, I know why I don't have joy because I'm still living in sin. And you're going to pray with me that God break the power of that sin through the Holy Ghost. The Holy God will put the Holy Ghost in you with such power that, that you don't have to struggle. The Lord will just powerfully encourage you and strengthen you so that you're not fighting it in your own strength, but in his power, his strength. And listen, if, if, if you're listening to the lies of the devil, the devil will lie to you and say that you're not going to make it. Uh, he will bring depression on you. Sometimes it's physical. Sometimes it's mental and, and, and spiritual. And many times any will just come and harass you with lies. But I'll tell you, wait, you know how to deal with the lies of the devil? Just remind him of the truth of God's word. Remind him of the truth of God's word. The devil has to flee at the truth. He can't handle the truth. Hallelujah. You just say, my Bible says, my Bible says if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me, to make me clean. And when you're clean, the devil has no rights. But I'll tell you, I want to tell you something. No matter how long you serve the Lord, no matter how you are in the Lord, he's always going to be an accuser of you. You're always going to have him accusing you. So just don't put up with it anymore. Say, devil, I've had enough of that. I'm not going to listen to you anymore. I'm going to believe what God's word says. I'm going to stand on the word of God. That's when joy comes, when you take your stand on the word, not on your feelings. If I lived by feelings, I'd never, hardly ever be able to survive. You can't live by your feelings. Amen. Pray with me now, right out loud. Jesus, I give you my heart with all of its sins and all of its weaknesses. And I come to you for help. Forgive me and deliver me from all the power of sin. 
Fill me with the Holy Ghost that I may have power and authority against the devil. Take all the fear out of my heart of the devil's power or the power of my flesh and help me to understand that he who lives in me is greater than all things else, all other things. Yes, all other things. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Lord Jesus, I want my joy back. Give it to me by faith. I believe you saved me, and I believe you can keep me. I come like a child in simple faith. I give you my heart, my confidence, and my love. All right, now I want you to just raise your hands and love Jesus right now. Just love him right now. Love him. Lord, I love you. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for caring about me. You'll never cut me off. You'll never cut me off, Jesus. You won't cut me off. Hallelujah. You won't cut me off. The Lord will not cut me off. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you will never cut me off. You'll strengthen me. You'll heal me. Deliver me. Glory. Hallelujah. City.